just a few announcements. Um, as a reminder, this space is not only our place for worship, but it also does a lot of other great things, like Senior Day. Um, so in June, July, and August, first Tuesday of the month is Senior Day. And Rachel has done a wonderful job um, working with Steve to really kind of unfold what that can look like. Um, and so this is, again, just your open invitation to come and be part of that day. We'll need volunteers to, like, for setup, to, you know, do the activities and things that are going to take place on each of those days. But it's just a great way for us to, again, be out engaging with the community and meeting new people. Um, in addition to that, everyone has a connection card. I asked you at the beginning of service to really think about all of the amazing and awesome things that you want to put on it. I hope you have made good decisions and, <laughs> and have filled it with great things. Um, I would just like to note, on the back there is a prayer and pray section and uh, there is a couple new spots where you can enlist the... Uh, crap. Sorry. You can, <laughs> you can um, share prayer or, bleh, You can share your prayer requests with either our leadership team, um, but we can email those out to our prayer team, and then they can also be shared here on Sunday mornings. So, uh, again, just a way for us to partner with you throughout the week um, as we lift up these praise and prayer requests. With that, I would like to welcome Pastor Zach to the stage. Good morning, church. Um, Gosh, you know, like God does things, and you're like, oh, it's just going to be a regular Sunday, right? And, and I wasn't having the best of Sundays because, just insider knowledge. So I've been doing a lot of just like t troubleshooting of sound, and like I want to make sure that this experience is the best we can uh, all the time. That's kind of the goal. Um, and it, every once in a while, like there's a, a little snag, and then like I'm not able to do much other than just like sound or video or fix stuff. And then I get to this point, and I'm like, okay, uh, well, I haven't really thought about the message at all, and I haven't really talked to anybody yet, so sorry. Uh, and then today, I was like, okay, just sit down at the piano, just, just get your stuff done, and then you'll preach, and then you'll be done today. And then, um, so I, I was over here, and I, and this, this statue is sitting on my, on my seat. Um... <laughs> And I was like, all right, which one of you goons put this on my seat? Like, that's, that was my feeling inside, right? I'm like, okay, that, maybe because I'm grumpy, and I, so I put it down. That's what I thought. Um, and then I sit down. It's like 10 o'clock, right? And I see Sarah sitting, so I'm sitting here. And then she goes like this. And I go, What? So Pam and Ellen, I just want to introduce to you. Um, these are like two of my closest mentors. Like they grew up, like I grew up in this small church in Mishawaka, Indiana, and they've been like members. How long have you been members there? 50 years, right? Like, so these people like were there when my family first got there. I, my family was basically grow, grew up in that church. Ellen talked a little bit about it. I started a worship service with my friends in that church, um, and I stood next to Ellen um, in our church choir for like six years, my adult choir for six years. Um, and just so that you all know, I don't know if you know this, but we just got done with uh, our sermon series in the book of Luke. Um, and in my confirmation, um, Alan and I walked through the book of Luke together. Like that was really the first experience that I had with like walking through the gospel before. Um, so it's crazy. It's just crazy that they're here. And then Pam was my boss for a little while when I was working at camp. Like it's just these people are the best people. Um, just thank you for being here um, and for everything that you guys have done. I appreciate it. Um, the gargoyle statue, I, is this the one that I gave to you? Okay, I gave him a gargoyle statue because like the book of Luke when I was 13, 14 was super confusing. I was like, what is this stuff? So the gargoyle kind of represented like the confusion because he's got his face like that. Anyways, um, oh man, this is crazy. Uh, We'll see how we do this. Um, so today, we're continuing our series in uh, a series that we're calling Rhythms of Grace, um, the practical ha missional habits that, that we practice together. Um, last week, we laid a, a big foundational piece of this series. Um, 
and really a, a foundational piece of our lives as, as people who follow Jesus. That in all things, all the time, every place we go, God is with us. And I know that's not like revolutionary, but like that's such an important like baseline thing for us to understand because this whole series is based off of the, the idea that, that Jesus in his final words to his friends, he says, I will be with you always. I will, I will give you a partner to join with you as you live life. The Holy Spirit is going to come and it, he's going to dwell in you in the most exciting moments of your life and the most mundane moments of your life. I will be with you. That is the promise that God gives. And then if this is true, and this is the question that we asked last week, if this is true, if God is always with us, what happens then if we see that everything that we do can have a missional impact? We talked about, we've been talking about for a number of months, we want to be a different kind of church. But really for us, we have to lean into the idea. It's not different. It's not like we're trying to like do this revolutionary way of doing church. It's like, how can we be more intentional about living the everyday stuff, the everyday mundane tasks, and leverage them for gospel intentionality? If God is with us in all things, what would it look like if we were intentional about using everything, every task, every routine, every rhythm in our life? Rhythm of the night. <laughs> Last week, Sean asked for that song. This week, we had to make sure it popped in. What happens if we use everything in our life so that God would be known and that the gospel may have the opportunity to make an impact in us and through us? Because based on our understanding of the Great Commission that's found in Matthew chapter 28, this is what we have. We are called as the body of Christ to do something with the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness and the love that God has extended to us through what Jesus did in his life, in his death, and his resurrection. We are called to do something. We are called to respond. As the church, as individuals, we're called to do something. But if you look from the outside in, if you look at our church or just a number of churches, a lot of our habits seem to point inward. We gather on Sundays because it's good for us. It's good for our souls. Some of our friends are here. It starts our week off right. We sing songs that we like to sing. We give praise to the God that we worship because, because in all of that, we feel more connected to the divine. We give money because someone's got to pay for the coffee we drink. Someone's got to take care of all the sound stuff in the bus. Someone has got to pay the staff at the church. Our churchy habits, they bind us together, which is good. Our, our habits, they connect us more deeply to the God that we've, we talk about here on Sundays, that we hear about through our, our Bible studies, through, through our songs, which is good. But from the outside looking in, our churchy habits, they can seem inwardly focused and I think that's what the world has begun to expect from us. That, that what you do in that building is what you do in that building, and really that's great for you, and you can experience that, and, and if, that's, if that's great for you, that's fine. But really that's everybody, what everybody expects. Our churchy habits seem to be just for church. From the outside looking in, what we do here. Though we proclaim the mission of Jesus to go, our habits tend to speak otherwise. Which is why I'm intrigued by the premise of the book that we've been using to anchor the series Surprise the World, Five Habits of Highly Missional People. If the world expects the church to be inwardly focused, but experiences people who are focused on the great commission of Jesus, people who are intentionally leveraging the everyday things of life for the sake of the building up of the kingdom, what would the world think? What happens when the world expects us to do churchy things in a building like this, yet experiences grace and love through Jesus in everything that they see us do? That's why Frost titled his book, Surprise the World. What happens when the 
church thinks differently about being the church? What happens when the church is more intentional about using the everyday tasks, the everyday rhythms of life to proclaim who God is and what God has done? What happens when the church isn't just about adding programs or doing Bible studies just in hopes to bring people in? What happens when we use the everyday things of life to extend grace in a world that lacks grace? What happens when the body of Christ stops saying that we go to church on Sundays and starts instead living into the potential that the church has to be the church in every single moment of every single day. And that's the premise of this book. That's the premise of this series. That's the premise of the five missional habits that Frost introduces. He introduces five habits that propel us not just to be the church, but be the church in the world. He introduces these five habits to help us learn missionally, live missionally, so that we might start to think missionally. The habits he speaks to foster a lifestyle which promotes a different way to think about the mission of God in the world. Throughout the book, Surprise the World, which if you haven't picked one up, we do have 10 more copies, so we got rid of all of our copies last week. We have 10 more copies. We're asking $5 or less a book. That's all they cost. So if you want to take one, you don't have $5, just take one. It's not that big a deal. That's our gift for you today. Um, but they'll be available. Are they at the coffee bar? Cool. Um, if you need a book, pick it up. And the, it's, we want you to have one of these, and we'll keep buying them as long as people want them. So you want them, we'll, we'll get them. But throughout this book, Frost unpacks five habits, these five habits. Bless, eat, learn, listen, set. And we're going to discuss in the next few weeks that, that these things aren't meant to just add busyness to our already busy lives. These five habits have the potential to become patterns of how we are the church, how we might become more intentional about living out the mission of Jesus every day, in every moment, not just on Sundays. I'm excited to see what's going to come. I'm also very nervous because I know that if I tell you that we have to do this, I also have to live this out in my own life. And I know how long it takes me to adopt a new normal in my life, to, to do different practices, right? To, to, to practice what we're preaching is essentially what I'm saying. It's hard for me to do that, but that's what we're here to do. You read your banner when you walk through the, the doors. We'll be on our buses when we get them wrapped is practicing the ways of Jesus together because that is who we have to be as a church. And I'm not necessarily saying like tomorrow you're going to be like this rock star missional person. If you read this book, you're going to be like the best missional expert in the world. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is what we're talking about here in this space and what we're really trying to be in the world is we're practicing these, the ways of Jesus together. Are we going to struggle with some of this stuff? Yeah. Some of these habits you might already do, but some of this stuff is going to take work for you to do. I want you to know that our intent through this series and beyond this series is to create a culture where we're lifting up, practicing the habits and extending grace to one another. We're working toward creating a space here in this space, in our leadership teams, in our, in our, in our office. We're, we're trying to create a space to fail. We're trying to create a space where we can be vulnerable. We're trying to create a space where we can speak to where we need help from one another. We're trying to, to practice the, the extending grace to one another because we know that this world is like deadlines and bottom lines and it's hard. But we don't work in a world of bottom lines with with the church. That's not, our bottom line is not money. Our bottom line is walking alongside people. Walking people alongside Jesus. That's a whole different ball game. And if we think the way the world tells us to think, we're going to be like, no, it's this program. It's this thing that we have to do. It's, it's this place where we have to go. It's, it's making sure all the videos, right? Right? But that's not us. That's not who we have to be here. Here we practice the ways of Jesus together. And that's why we've, we're leaning into this series. With that, uh, we're going to talk about the first of these uh, habits, to bless. Um, and you'll find this in Frost's book. And a couple questions that we have to address before we're going to send you with a challenge today um, that comes out of Frost's book um, is two questions. The first is, what is a blessing? And the second is, what does it mean to bless? The word bless is kind of a weird word. I feel like it's a, like, for me, in a lot of ways, it's synonymous with the word lucky. Like, if 
I'm dealing with church people, like, oh, you are so blessed in that situation. If I'm working with non-church people, it's like, oh, you were super lucky in that situation, right? You see the difference there? Like, I just, I just bought a car, right? For a really good deal from a really good church-going guy. And church people would say, God showed you favor. God blessed you with a guy who was a Christian. And God showed you favor with the deal that you got in the car. While my non-church-going friends would say, man, the market was really good at this time. They were trying to get rid of cars at the, at the beginning of the month, whatever. And, and the guy you were dealing with, man, he, he'd only sold one car in the last two weeks. He was, you got lucky. I mean, usually for me, that's how I wrestle with the word. It's either luck or favor. But the word blessing or bless is difficult to describe because it's this abstract concept. There's not a clear way of talking about it. At least in our language, this is the case. One word that can take on many meanings. But in Scripture, the word bless that shows up many times is different based on what the origin of the language is. In the New Testament, we see two words for the word bless. The the first is barach, which is a verb. And the second is ashar, which is an adjective. I want to come back to barach in just a second because I think this is where Frost comes at uh, the word blessing. Um, and gives us action steps. But the second word, uh, ashar, which translate for us to, to, to mean happiness. So in Job chapter 5, this word ashar or blessing comes in there. Blessed is the man who, whom God corrects. So do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. So this word ashar or blessed is connected to the knowledge that God is at work to direct us toward the right path. God's correction is the display of God's love here. Like a parent disciplining a child for touching a stove and yelling at them for not touching the stove. It's kind of that same concept. Uh, Or in the first few verses of first psalm, the first psalm. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seats of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever, whatever he does prospers. So in the book of Psalms, this, this reference is kind of that happy blessing for those who love and fear the Lord. We're going to jump to the New Testament, and there are two more words. These, so those two words are, are Hebrew words. These two words are Greek words, makharios and eulogeo. So the first one of the Makarios is found in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, what's known as um, the Beatitudes, where we hear, blessed are those. So these are the words. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those. Blessed are those. We hear that over and ago, over again. So this is kind of like the next step to the, the ashar, that, that Old Testament word. Uh, it's, it's happiness, but it's happiness found in the purpose and the fulfillment of God's promises. Does that make sense? So it's, it's like a, an extra step beyond what the Old Testament word is. So the second word in the New Testament for blessing is the word eulogeo, which focuses more on good words or a good report that someone gives of another person. So if you think about the root of that, right, eulogy, that's kind of the same concept. At a funeral, someone gives a eulogy, focuses on the good things of their life, right, Um, the impact that a person has made. Um, This kind of blessing is pointing out, is highlighting good things. So you can say like, oh, that person was a blessing, or oh, like, you blessed that person, it was great. So it's, it's that concept. All of these different words, though, throughout Scripture, are kind of like, they kind of mean the same thing, but they're, they're kind of not. That's why, like, the word blessing is kind of weird, because it's, it's an abstract concept. But roughly, we see that blessing is the happiness found in the acknowledgement of what God is doing in and through our lives. Because in the beginning... We understand that the origin of God's design for creation was for all creatures, especially humanity, to experience prosperity, peace, and fulfillment. 
But that is ruined when sin enters the picture. And then throughout the scriptures, we see that God is working to bless the people, right? Like trying to lead them down a path of happiness of, and, and pr- fulfillment. Um, through the, he's working through the, the brokenness, through the sinfulness, all the while trying to execute the plan of redemption, which is just essentially trying to lead pa- people back on the path, right? Culminating with the ultimate blessing that God gives through the new life and the grace and the love and the forgiveness that we find in, in the person of Jesus. The one who comes down from on high, who bends down to be like one of us so that we might experience abundant grace and blessings. Which leads me back to that first word that we talked about. The, the word that we find in the, the book of Genesis. The word is barach. In Hebrew, the literal word, the literal meaning of the word is, is to kneel to. So the barach is like the literal term is to kneel to. To the action of lowering oneself, the action of bending down from on high to another. And if you just think about that concept, it, it, it kind of like opens up how God blesses. The very presence of God kneeling down, bending down from a higher place, coming down to us. Does that not sound like the whole message of the gospel? Because God in God's great mercy and graciousness, God comes to earth and makes us right with God by coming down, by kneeling down in the presence of God's Son, Jesus, to love and to serve and to care for, or to bless, Barach. The blessing of God is the action of God coming to us so that we might experience other aspects of the word blessing, as we described earlier. The blessing of God is the action of God coming to us, which is, my, in my estimation, the, the best answer to that first question, what is a blessing? God literally coming down, bending down, kneeling to us. And it's the action of God kneeling to our lives so that we might experience happiness found in the purpose and the fulfillment of God's promise. Which leads us right into that second question. then: What does it mean to bless? Or what does it mean to be a blessing? I'm going to read Genesis 12 again, the the beginning of the story of Abraham slash Abram. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. This is the, this is the Barak, right? Like this is the kneeling down to. I will kneel down to you. I'm going to open myself up to you. This is what God's saying to Abram. I'm going to bless you, but, there's a but there, but in response I'm going to ask you to kneel down to others. You should kneel to others in the same way I have done to you. And obviously for us, the best example of this is Jesus, right? But at the end of Jesus' time on earth, what does Jesus say? As the Father has sent me, I send you. As the Father has knelt down to, to you, I am now asking you to kneel down to others. As the Father has called me to love you, to care for you, to forgive you, to serve you, to come down from on high for you, to kneel to you for you, to make this all right again. So so now I ask you to do the same. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. I am asking you to kneel to others so that they might be lifted up. I am asking you to be a blessing for others so that they may experience the happiness and joy found in the purpose and fulfillment in my promise. As the Father has sent me to be a blessing to you, now I'm sending you to be a blessing to others. And Frost, in his book, he talks about how blessings work, or what does it mean to bless others. He says the term that he goes off of is is blessing means to, to strengthen another's arm to build them up, to fill them with encouragement for them to increase in strength and prosperity. So for Frost, to bless others means to do anything to relieve another in their life, 
to do anything that you can for another for them to breathe easier. For you to do anything to lift one's spirit. To do anything to alleviate another's stress. We have been blessed to be a blessing. We have been called to bless others because of God blessing us. We have been called to to kneel down because Jesus first knelt to us. We're called to strengthen another's arm because Jesus has already strengthened our arm. As you free, read Frost's book, you see that he likes to like explain this, but then he likes to hit you with the challenge. And church, this, these challenges aren't meant to like stress you out. These challenges are meant to just pop in in random places in your life for you to experience more of what the missional habits look like. And his first habit in this challenge is simply this. Bless three people this week. We have been blessed to be a blessing. Jesus has knelt down to us for us and calls us to kneel to others for the sake of building others up. And this week, based on what Frost is asking, is what would it look like to leverage the the smallest rhythms of your life to bless others, to lift others up, to alleviate stress for someone else? He says, he gives, then he tells you who the three people should be. I mean, he makes it really simple. The first person, somebody sitting around you here today. Like, uh, somebody just did that. Who was that? I heard like, oh. I'm like, yeah. That was awesome. That was like perfectly timed. Um, you, Five dollars to you later. Uh, yeah, someone in the body, like a, another person who is a church-going person, like um, how, you, how you interact with maybe it's someone in your family. Um, one person, though, maybe sitting in this room or in your family, one person is one of the people that you bless. The second person you bless, Frost says, is not a believer. Someone who does not go to church. Someone who, who maybe is doubting this whole church thing. Um, again, it's, it's not really the... The whole purpose is not for you to convert anyone. That's not the reason why any of this stuff is happening. It's simply to extend grace in a world that lacks grace. And the third person, he says, well, that's up to you. That's a wild card. They could be sitting here. They can be sitting next to you. They can be sitting at the grocery store or a coworker or your family member. Whoever you want, bless them. The idea here is that in the rhythms of life, the rhythms of grace introduced through this habit, we, we have to think about how might I extend grace? How might I bend my life for the sake of others? You might say like, well, that seems like another thing for me to have to do, Zach. You just said that that wasn't the case. And you, that's kind of true. It is, it is that, but it's also at the same time thinking and, and living out a more intentional model of ministry. I'm not asking you to like make 14 trips to the, the Walmart and try to bless someone every single time. Now I'm like, you're going to go to Walmart anyways, or you're going to go to the grocery store anyways, or you're going to go to the restaurant anyways, you're going to go, you're going to go to work anyways. You're going to deal with people. And what happens then when you just go, Lord, how can I bless someone today? Because you're already going to be with them. Frost answers the the question, how? Well, how am I going to do this? He gives you another three ways to how to do it. The first way, Words of encouragement or words of affirmation. In these moments, if you just simply say, hey, Larry, I like your shirt. Boom! Larry just got blessed! (laughs) That's as easy as it is! Like, literally, that's easy. Like, or I'm like, Jen, you know, you're the best. Blessed! Boom! Boom! Like words of encouragement, words that build people up. If it's a thank you note, if it's, if it's just a random note you drop in the mail, if it's, if it's someone that you like see at the store and you just go, I really like your hair. I really like your, your earrings. I really like whatever it is. For some of us, like me, I just tell people that they're the best anyways. This stuff is right up my alley. I'm like, a bl- I just bless two people. I'm, I, all I got to do is one more. Boom. Um, <laughs> For me, it's easy, right? But here's the thing. Get this. If, if words of encouragement are not your like, strong suit, if you're not an affirmation person and you write a thank you note for something, 
you want to know how the world's going to be surprised by what we're doing in here? By doing this crazy, out-of-the-ordinary thing. It's, it's so simple, and yet, like, all you got to do is just think about it a little bit differently. The second way that he does this, he says, um, where am I at? Um, an act of kindness. Maybe an old lady needs to cross the street. Or maybe you're seeing a coworker at work who's just incredibly stressed by the workload and could just simply use another set of eyes on a project. Or maybe you have a family member who has been burdened with illness or ailment who could just use a set of hands. A blessing here is, is simply providing practical assistance. The third how Frost suggests you can bless someone is through a gift, maybe a meal for a family who's been dealing with health issues, or maybe it's a Starbucks card like the McCarthy's gave to me last week. You guys, that was last week's blessing, not this week's. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I, uh, that wasn't meant to embarrass you. I apologize if it did. Anyways, um, Rachel was telling me a story about this. Hunter, I see you, buddy. Um, Rachel was telling me this week, this week? This last week, they came home, and there was like a picture frame with all of the newspaper articles that, from Hunter's swim season. Randomly, right? Drop there. You want to tell, talk to me about how bless, you bless people that way? Like, it means so much when it's, it's really like random thoughts of, of a gift, right? It's a, a thought gift. Like, how can, I, how can I give something to someone that they're not necessarily expecting or they don't really know? Like, again, some of us are really good at gift giving. Others of us, like, have to struggle with it. And if you're really good at words of affirmation, like, try to do the gift giving. Don't let yourself off the hook like I just have this morning. Like, I'm going to bless three people by the time I walk out, Right? I'm going to yell to my friends on the lake, be like, guys, just go get them fish, right? Like, I'll be done right away. But for me, it's going to, like, how can I do those other things? But this week, three people, one member of our church, one person who's not a Christian or is not churchy, and one is the la- is a wild card. I think I've said a lot today that seems really simple. Blessing people is the foundation of who we are as the church, but it's really easy to take for granted the power each of us has been given to extend grace through our words and our actions in the everyday stuff of life. We have been blessed to be a blessing, and yeah, that sounds great, and yeah, it's fairly simple to wrap our minds around, but what happens when we stop talking about it and we start doing it? What happens when we surprise the world by living an unexpected life? When the love and the happiness that we get from the promises of God that we talk about here, what happens when those things flow out of us into the everyday places of our life? I know this sounds service level, but let's be honest, in so many of our lives, it's so difficult to do anything like this. We might understand it, but we're not always intentional about taking about what we're talking about in here, out there. To the lake, to the grocery store, to work, to school. But church, we have this opportunity to start living more intentionally. Taking, taking the, the, the moniker of being just Sunday people and, and being everyday people who extend grace. This week, that simply means to bless three people. Because if we can create a culture where the rhythms of, of our lives are used to bless others... I think two things are going to happen. One, we're going to become a tighter community because you cannot tell me that if we're not blessing one another, that those blessings aren't going to ricochet and there's going to be a stronger sense of family in this room. Amen? That's a big deal. That's why the first person has to be the person at a church. The second way that we're going to experience this is if we're always looking to bless others, if we're always looking outward, you cannot tell me that people aren't going to start asking why. Being intentional about blessing others is going to cause a world that is down on the church to start asking why, which will only lead us the opportunities to speak to the why. Why do we do what we do? Well, because Jesus first did for me. Jesus first knelt down for me. That's why I'm kneeling down to you. 
first habit, the first rhythm is foundational, foundationally to living more intentionally. To do church differently. Just like what we've been talking about. Blessing others is a foundational piece for us as we look to extend grace through the everyday rhythms of life. Let that be true for you today. Go out and bless three people this week. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for this day. It's crazy to think how simple the word bless is. But with it just comes an incredible understanding of how you work. You knelt down. You subjected yourself to becoming like us so that we might know you better like a parent with a child. You knelt down to help us understand more of who you were and and what you're doing. You kneel down to where we are so that we might see you face to face, that we might know you more. Lord, I'm just so thankful for the actions of your blessings on our behalf, Lord. We don't deserve it, but you keep showing up through the words of encouragement and affirmation in our lives, through acts of service of other people for us, through gifts, thought gifts. You show up all the time and you bless us. You kneel down to us. Lord, I just ask you that make us people like you. Mold us to take similar positions, kneeling to others so that that others may be filled up and encouraged. Work in us, each of us, as we walk the path of blessing others. Open our eyes, open our hearts to the places where we're going to be called this week, to the ways that you're calling us to bless one another and to to bless everyone we come in contact with. Give us wisdom and discernment. Grant us courage and strength to rise to the challenge of kneeling to others for their sake. Because we want to surprise the the world, Lord. We want to extend grace in this world, Lord. We want to, to live out our lives with gospel intentionality, Lord. We want to use the everyday tasks and places in this world to extend your grace through our lives. Lord, we love you so much. We give you all the thanks and praise. We ask all of this in your son's name. Amen.